community coordinator for the open source team at edX and a very strong open software advocate. Please welcome Molly. Hi, I just wanted to start out by saying um, the other day Karen Sandler from the Software Freedom Conservancy sent an email out to members asking us if we would wear our shirts at LCA. Uh, because Bradley Kuhn isn't here yet, I don't have my shirt. However, I thought this was a great opportunity to thank them for the work that they do and have done over the years. Because of the work that they're doing helping enforcing licensing, uh, it allows us, projects like Open edX that use the AGPL, to be able to continue using it. Uh, and since I'm thanking them, it would also be great to give a shout out to the Free Software Foundation um, for all the work they've done in creating these licenses. So could we just like, yeah, free software, yay. Cool. So I'm here to talk about two things, really. Um, what I'm really talking about is using a free open source copyleft license for a project. Uh, and I'm kind of packaging that by talking about the one I work for, which is the Open edX project at edX. So the things we're going to do is first I'm going to talk a little bit about the AGPL, just to make sure we're all on the same page about what it is. I'm going to talk about Open edX, and as part of that, I'm going to explain why I should not have written Open edX on this slide. Uh, some successes for our project, considerations, conflicts, and ongoing conversations, uh, and that kind of means all the stuff that happens that really aren't successes, uh, and then I'm going to summarize it and hopefully say something inspirational at that point. Great. So what is the AGPL? Uh, the Afero General Public License is a license that was based on the GNU General Public License. It's a free software license, uh, which means that in the, within the software, every user of it has the following four freedoms. They have the freedom to run it however they want, to share it with their friends, to modify it, and then to share those modifications with their friends. Uh, the GNU General Public License is also a copyleft license, which means not only do you have the option, would one have the option of sharing their modifications, they in fact have to share their modifications. Uh, in the GPL, there's, there's kind of this like loophole, um, the application service provider loophole, uh, which there's this argument with it where you can say, well, if I'm running software as a service, I don't really have to share the code because I'm the one running it and not someone else. Um, this uh, was closed by the AGPL, that's why it was created. So what they did was they added, this is section 13, um, and then this is another paragraph about it. Uh, you can read these later. The, uh, reading the GPL and the AGPL is a great party. I highly recommend doing it. Um, and this just explicitly states that even with server-side hosting, you need to, to be sharing your code. So now, what is open edX? Uh, this is actually a question I get a lot. Um, so there, there's this organization called edX. Uh, it's a 501c3 located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was started as a joint venture between Harvard and MIT when they really wanted to get in on this open education game, hosting courses on the internet as opposed to just sharing materials. Um, so in order to do that, they needed to create a platform, uh, and that was the Open edX project, the Open edX platform. Um, it's Open edX is a trademark, actually, uh, and at least in America, when you're using a trademark, it's supposed to be an adjectival and followed by something. Uh, so I really should have said the Open edX project earlier. Uh, and then there's edX.org. That's the destination website. If you go to that, that is where we are hosting courses, uh, which we do in collaboration with partners, um, including Harvard, MIT, uh, University of California, Berkeley. More relevant to this crowd, um, there's uh, University of Queensland, Adelaide, uh, among our partners. Um, so what's the Open edX platform, right? It's, it's a learning management system or a course management system. Uh, people can use it to host courses, to teach courses, to learn from courses, and also to, to manage like some learner information. Um, when you install it, you get Studio, which is this not quite WYSIWYG uh, editor to build courses, discussion forms, and insights, which is an analytics uh, application. So what can you do with it? You can teach anything. That's, that's like the great thing that we're really excited about. Um, people are doing more traditional, more expected things like uh, intro to programming, chemistry, people are using it for corporate training, um, but there's also great stuff out there like a parfait making class, that's a personal favorite. 
Um, and you can learn almost anything. Learning is really mitigated by what people are willing to teach. Um, a history of our licensing and a little bit about the project. It was launched in May of 2012, uh, and when we launched it, it was closed source. Uh, I don't know how many of you out there have worked on projects that started out as closed and, and decided to open. Uh, when we were created, we promised we would do it. Um, but frequently, as some of you may know, when you're starting with something, maybe the code isn't ready for everyone to see it and work on it yet. Maybe the project isn't really ready. Uh, or maybe um, you're just not prepared at that point and have the resources to manage contributions and contributors. Uh, then a little over a year later, in June of 2013, we released the main code base under the AGPL that was done with strong support from Stanford University. They're not a partner institution, but they're a good friend and a strong supporter. Um, it's worth noting that in September of 2014, we decided to relicense our dev tools to Apache. Um, we decided that it was okay to have this more permissive non-copyleft license when it came to developing uh, and using the tools that we use internally since we think they're so great. Um, and there was, there was this decision that contributing changes you made to those back to the community was less important than contributing like platform changes back. Uh, at the same time, we also relicensed our Xbox API to be Apache. Um, Xbox are plugins and modules that you can make for the platform. Uh, so let's say that you want to change the type of video format that you have in your courses. That's an Xbox someone made. Uh, you can also do stuff, let's say you're teaching a biology class and want to uh, have protein folding. Okay, uh, we have a contributor agreement that people sign. Uh, if you want to read it, it's up there. It's pretty basic. Um, we have one for individuals and institutions. The individual one promises that all materials you've made are your own. Uh, the institution one says that, yes, we're agreeing that this individual's uh, contributions which we own are okay to use. It has a joint ownership clause. This is kind of interesting. Um, and allows for, like, it, it allows the opportunity for either party to decide to relicense some of their contributions. That's um, there. Uh, when we talk about our community from the open edX side of the project, we, of, of like the edX project, is we have two types of people involved, really. We have contributors. So those are people who are doing things and giving back. There are technical and non-technical contributors. If anyone here has a better term for someone who is contributing something other than code, other than non-technical, that would be great. Because um, I think it's really important to acknowledge those contributions as being just as valid uh, and, and part of the whole community. Uh, there are also user communities. So a user community is going to be the people who are running courses with the platform, installing it, setting it up, um, but not necessarily giving back uh, like development to the project. And then there are learners. Um, learners aren't really something I would say is part of the open edX community, but they are part of the ecosystem. So they're, they're the people we think about every day when we do what we're doing. Okay, so here are some things that I would go as far as to call successes. Uh, but in order to define success, first you have to think about what counts as success here. Uh, our edX has two stated goals, uh, one of which is to reach a billion learners, to have a billion people out in this world learning with the platform in some capacity, and financial sustainability. Um, so we're going to look at a few things kind of from both of those perspectives. Uh, another definition relevant to success is, is when you're looking at free and open source communities, you can look at quantity, so quantity of users, a quantity of members of the community, quantity of contributors. Uh, you can look at quality, right? So who's, who's using your product or your project? What are they doing with it? Uh, what kind of contributions are people making and are they good contributions, right? Are they valuable? Are others using them? Are they well written, well created? Uh, strength of community is also another great metric. It's, it's a fuzzy one though, it's probably the hardest to measure, right? So it's, it's are people happy? Are, do they feel engaged? Do they like interacting with each other? Uh, do they come out to conferences and are they like strong, loud supporters? Uh, and measuring success is easy, right? 
I was hoping people would laugh at that. Uh, so first we're going to talk about some technical stuff. Um, is that? Yeah, it's kind of visible. Uh, GitHub commits. GitHub commits are totally one way we can measure technical success, right? Um, does this have a pointer? I don't know. Um, if you look, so there's like the first really big peak and then a drop and then right after the drop there's some more peaks. Uh, that's when the project switched to the AGPL. Um, and was released on GitHub. So you'll notice that actually there weren't really more contributions. Um, in fact, there was a drop in contributions. Um, this can in part be accounted for by our, uh, like our getting the platform ready to be out in the world and so that people could interact with it. Um, but it can also take into account things like, well, people were using it and they did some stuff at first, but they didn't really have a lot to do. Maybe the platform was so great, they didn't need to do a lot for it. Um, a little bit later in this, you can also kind of see it drop off even more. Um, and part of that was a drive for people to be creating X blocks rather than creating features they were pushing back in. Um, this has to do a lot with how the project works from a governance perspective and also from a running perspective. Everything in the master branch is run on our website. Um, and so kind of what goes into that is a bit more tenuous than what's just available for everyone. Uh, so maybe we could say that quantity-wise, this wasn't the most successful. Um, but what about quality-wise? Right, so here are some community-driven features we have. These are great. Right, we have Creative Commons support. Uh, this was not something that existed before. Now, when you create a course or you upload content, not only can you license it under Creative Commons license, which arguably you could do before, now it's easy to do it, and that's way more important. Uh, there's right to left support. Um, this is great for Arabic-speaking countries, for example. Um, it was really hard to localize and internationalize when you just can't use uh, the text in it single sign-on, and then there's uh, LTI learning tool integration. Um, with uh, education projects, people can be LTI providers and or LTI receivers. Um, when you're a provider, what that means is you can take one part of one project and drop it into another. Uh, so now, for example, say someone loved our video player, they could now use it in another place. Uh, too much. Uh, so X-Blocks, right? We have this X-Block directory of 45 things people have developed, things that have been developed. Um, from our side, it is an extensive list. I think it includes nearly, if not every X-Block we've made. Um, it, however, definitely doesn't include all the ones other people have made. So there's 28 not of non-edX origin. Uh, and quantity-wise, that's actually pretty good as a percentage, right? It's saying that the people out there are as invested and involved as we are when it comes to creating X-Blocks. So let's talk about the, the quality side of those. These are also super great and useful. Um, open response assessments mean that people have the ability to contribute more types of, uh, of files when they're answering questions. Um, Video.js, HTML5 player, great. So you want to use HTML5, make your videos more accessible to a wider variety of audiences in terms of their technical specifications on their home machines, uh, staff-graded assignments, which means that people working in the course can more easily, uh, people teaching the course can more easily grade assignments people have made. And then there's certificate support. There's a lot of that. Uh, if you finish a course, or well, when you're creating courses, you have the opportunity to give certificates for people completing them. Um, so it's been great that we have good systems to navigate and negotiate and manage that. Bad at clicker. Um, so let's talk about usage now, right? So, so there's development on the platform, but then there's also usage, and that's all the people out there who are running it. Uh, here are some numbers from other people. Uh, there are 203 public sites. A public site is one that you can find and see the courses of uh, just openly on the internet. That might not mean you can take them, but you can find them and see what's happening. There are non -non nine non-public sites or private ones. Um, those ones are things that are closed within institutions. Uh, they're used internally and even just not accessible outside of them. Uh, among these courses, there are 2,851 last I checked, last we checked, which was January 19th. 
Um, we manually count them all periodically. It's a good time. Um, and they're in 20 different languages. So to talk about each of these, uh, among all the sites that exist, we are the one red sliver, and everyone else is all the blue. So that's kind of nice to know that there's enough that we're very narrow in that. Um, courses. We have a, about 853. Um, and then the rest of the world has produced 2,800 something. So percentage wise, we actually have a lot there. But if you think about it, what we do full time is we develop this platform, we create these courses, and we help people host them. Other teams are much smaller. It might be something people do in addition to their other responsibilities, right? So I know that uh, many schools, it, uh, many schools that are hosting courses on their own and running their own instances, you're going to have a team of maybe three people doing course creation or helping each other out. Um, uh, Polytechnic University of Valencia, for example, they actually, their team isn't especially large, but they have really, really good video support within the university, and that's rare, so it's easier for them. Uh, you know, we have 40-something developers, a team of 150 or so total, um, so it's a lot easier for us. Here's some language stuff. Is that, uh, it's kind of legible. Um, stuff on the edX side, everything except Hindi, which is bolded, uh, is something that the community is also using in terms of the languages out there. Uh, things on this list that really excite me personally are Basque and Catalan, because uh, I have met very few speakers of those. Uh, Kazakh is also exciting, and these things are exciting because it's, it's exemplary of global reach. Um, the list on the edX side, I think, is also a little uh, obfuscative, maybe, uh, because, for example, we have Mandarin listed, and I know that when we're talking uh, about the like traditional uh, writing, for example, it's only uh, subtitles for one course. Uh, and I haven't really gone through those in depth. That might be something worth doing. Uh, so I think uh, from the, the, the quantity and quality side here, actually the community is doing really well, right? They're having this great global reach. They're coming from and reaching different countries than we have any ability to touch. Um, and the kind of stuff they're producing is really great. Now here's some fun stuff, the kind of stuff that like makes us happy or makes me happy. Um, things people teach, uh, things people say, and things people do. So here are examples of some things people teach. Uh, this I picked out. Um, it's the Mad Maker Challenge. It's done by the University of Sydney. Uh, it's a thing they do on their own. It's, I think, for um, year nine students, for them and their teachers to go through this project together and build stuff and learn in this hands-on way. They're bringing the maker ideal into a classroom setting. Um, and giving students this whole new opportunity. Uh, the next three are ones that are favorites of my team, the open source team. There are three of us right now. Uh, this is GBC College. Uh, GBC College is a Hare Krishna project. Uh, they're super friendly. Um, and they're using it to teach different things about being involved in the organization, doing temple administration, uh, like support. And so there are classes that they're running that are, that are both on these religious philosophical issues, but in addition, they actually have one on temple administration. I didn't get a picture of that. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's Educate Workforce. It's by Clemson University. Uh, and what they're doing with it is they're providing a classroom side of technical and vocational training, um, which is allowing people who are uh, participating in this program so that Clemson has the ability to help their communities outside of more traditional, like, uh, university and post-secondary education. Um, uh, so this, this is the kind of stuff that creates a blended classroom, which means you're learning stuff outside and then you're doing hands-on stuff inside. Uh, this is also Pilates, if you want to learn Pilates on the internet. I actually think it's a website for Pilates training, uh, or like to train people to teach it. Um, but I, I think we felt like we really made it the day that people were using the platform to teach Pilates. Uh, here's some stuff people have said. This was from one of the guys from GBC who's developing there. Who needs Nirvana when you have X blocks? You know, 
Um, I wanted to give something back. I think these are lovely examples of successes. Uh, people who say things like this, this was one specific person, but we've heard the sentiment from multiple people. The sentiment being, I took a course on edX, I learned so much, I thought it was so great, now I really want to contribute back to the project. Um, so this particular one was by somebody who took an introduction to Python course, uh, and then did some work, made some commits, a PR. This is another one I really liked. Uh, that somebody tweeted at us when we switched our DevTools and XBlock API to Apache. Um, and what I like about this is it's showing a dedication and real belief in the mission of the project, in reaching people, and in sharing what we're doing. Right? So these are all things that I consider successes because they're showing that people out there are developing the project, they're using it, they're doing things with it. They're doing this in like pretty high numbers in external facing ways um, and they're creating great things. And this really wouldn't be possible if we weren't using a free software license. Oh, all right, here's some cool stuff that, that people do. Um, these people, they came to our conference last year, and they were super psyched to meet our CEO. They love the project so much that they think he's super cool. Um, here are some people from a hackathon that was run in France. Uh, and all the way to one side, you'll see our former vice president of product. They uh, invited her and some other people out there to participate from our side. Uh, this is a photo taken by a med student at Stanford University. Some Stanford University medical students put together this, this like learning course on treating clubfoot, which apparently is a very like solvable problem. Um, and then they took that out to other places in the world to help healthcare professionals learn how to do that. Um, so these are also successes based around our metrics, like our goals of reaching learners and being financially sustainable. Learners is a much more obvious side to it. Um, we as a website, edX.org, has about 5 million learners, more than that now. Uh, the community has about 11 million. That's an estimate based on things people have reported to us. It is by no means an exhaustive reporting. Uh, it's worth noting that the sites that we know about are self-reported. There are things people have added their names to lists, they've contacted us, friends of theirs or people who found those websites have contacted us. Some of them we find through just like manual web searching. Uh, there are some key phrases we use that show up a lot. Uh, in sites. There's also, um, uh, at the bottom of web pages, there's a little like powered by open edX button. Um, and a lot of people, rather than hosting that image themselves, just refer to one we host of it. Uh, and that's been a super useful tool. We don't have a phone home feature. Um, and so some of those groups have been kind enough to tell us approximately how many people are using their sites. Uh, and we get a total of around 11 million, which is really wonderful. Um, so when it comes to the financial sustainability side, this is like a little bit more flexible of a thing. Um, people are building the platform, they're making it stronger, they're making it more resilient, they're giving it more features, and that just makes it more appealing to people. Um, by getting the name out there, more organizations are aware of it. Um, at this point, we have really great partnerships with groups like um, uh, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, University of Queensland, um, University of California, Berkeley, University of Zurich, there's a whole bunch of people I can't name them all, I'm not even going to try. Cool. So now I'm going to talk about some of the less great stuff about it, because if you're going to talk about a project, you really need to focus on what's good and what's not so good. Violations. Uh, since I'm talking about the AGPL here, it's really important to think about how people are violating the license and if it happens, right? If you're going to have an open project that reaches a certain size, you're eventually going to find violations of your license. So what do you do with them? I don't have a clear answer to this. Uh, I have a few cases that I want to talk about, though. Sometimes you're really, really lucky, and you find one, and maybe it's an accident, maybe it's something someone did on purpose, you don't really know, but you have a good relationship with those people, or they're just nice. So you send them a letter and you say, hey, we noticed that you're not really sharing your code, and the license says you kind of have to. If you're lucky, this is what happens. 
Um, France University Numérique is France's national project. I love them in part because of this. Uh, they added a, a page to their page that said, hey, just so you guys know, this is like what we're running. Here's a link to their repo. Here's a link to our repo of the stuff we've done. Um, and they have a great sense of humor, so they like to make puns on their name. Uh, there's fun apps and fun boxes. They have some other fun stuff, too, if you'd like to check that out. But can you always ask, right? And you can't. Sometimes you can't really ask people because your project is small, because you're worried, because uh, let's say like there's you by yourself and then you have this like big scary company that's violating your license. Well, what can you do then? Maybe you don't feel like you have the resources, maybe reinforcing it is hard. Uh, or if you're another organization, maybe you're just friends with someone and when they say no, you feel like you can't really push it. Um, there's also a question worth asking is, is, is it valuable to fight every violation somebody has over your license if you have enough users, right? So if we have 10,000 users and five people are violating it, do we really want to go after those people? Or do you really want to go after those people when you're having you know, all of these other things that people are producing and giving back to you? Uh, there's dual licensing, so by that what I really mean is when we switch some stuff to Apache, uh, that was kind of scandalous, as uh, some people were really upset as evidenced earlier. Um, so far it's worked out, uh, but it's always kind of contentious. Uh, there are lots of biases against the AGPL and biases against copyleft. Some of these come out as, uh, you know, we have one contributor, he's really great, I'm a big fan of his. Uh, he also really enjoys arguing with me about it and explaining to me in depth why he thinks copyleft licenses are bad and restrict what they can do. Um, you know, it, it's undeniable to say that we don't, we have people who won't collaborate with us or who have chosen not to use the platform because of the licenses and because they're either afraid of touching them or afraid of being near them. Maybe code will get leaked into other places and then they'll be in these weird situations with uh, copyright from their perspective of having to share more stuff than they wanted. Um, so that's in some ways been limiting. We've had some really in-depth conversations in some cases. Uh, there are a lot of large corporations who are interested and excited in interacting with a project like ours. They have education arms, they have nonprofit arms, volunteer efforts, uh, and then they don't feel like they can really touch what we're doing. Um, I know one extreme example of this is there's at least, this was not us, but I do think is interesting. Um, one of my colleagues used to work somewhere where if you wanted to interact with non, uh, with non copyrighted code where there wasn't some kind of formal agreement, you actually had to have someone else read it and then get back to you with updates on it. Uh, so in summary, like we've had some really good successes and we've had some stuff not work out so well. Um, Examples of things that haven't really worked well include these licensing issues. We have people who just don't want to touch the code. Uh, however, when you're talking about an AGPL project or you're talking especially about an open education project, your goal is to reach out and empower and enable as many people as you can to learn not just what they need to learn but what they want to learn. From one level, from the basic level, we are most successful in the number of people we've been able to reach and the number of users we've been able to have. And that would simply not be possible if we weren't using a free software license. Beyond that, because we're using a copyleft license, everything people are doing, they're giving back. It's creating a much more robust, it's a stronger platform. Uh, it's providing opportunities and use cases that both we never thought were possible, but also that enable people to be teaching all sorts of things everywhere. Uh, so I think it's really great. I think what we're doing is really great, and I really appreciate all the stuff the AGBL has enabled us to do, even taking into account the times when it has been less enthusiastic. Uh, so do people have any questions? Yeah. I have someone running a question. 
Oh, yeah. I'm confused. Yes. This is all about AGPL. Yes. But then there was that bit about Apache. Did yeah. it relicense? Is it now due licensed? Is it? it I'm, I'm confused. OK. Um, so the project, so the base, the base project is an AGPL project. So that means the platform itself. All the Xbox we're producing, everything we produce or things that interact with it directly are under the AGPL. So all the features I talked about are using AGPL licenses. Additionally to that, we have our developer tools, the things we are using for our testing uh, internally. And we decided that we cared more about enabling as many people as possible to use them and to deal with those cases where people are limited because of other copyright constraints or they feel limited because of their organizations or they're fearful of what could possibly happen. Uh, there's also the XBlock API, which is Apache licensed. And the decision behind that was because there were a number of organizations who felt as though they needed to be able to close and maintain proprietary X blocks in order to be financially successful or sustainable. Um, the way we, we have been very good at enabling other companies to make a lot of money. Um, not just through that, but through people who are service providers. Uh, they're helping organizations stand up instances of it. They're helping with course creation. Sometimes they're doing that all themselves. Uh, on, on like behalf of others. Um, and so for some of them being able to have these proprietary Xbox were like really important to them. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah, I should let the, the dude do that. Hello. You've Hi. been saying X blocks a lot. Um, with the licensing and stuff, have you had any issues from Microsoft about it sounding a lot like Xbox? No, that has never come up. Nor have we had issues from Pokemon, because there's a Pokemon Xbox. <laughs> okay. Hi. I, I've got one, if you're waiting. Yeah, wait. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, thanks very much. It's really good to hear about an AGPL project. We've we run the Mahara project, which is GPL. So um, uh, I just wondered, do, do you find uh, any of your institutions, like your universities and so on, concerned about when they stand up a site themselves, uh, some of their, um, what they might call collateral, like the graphics and, and front end stuff, uh, that, that they would feel compelled to release that under a GPL or a GPL license? I have not personally had any conversations with people about that or heard of them. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't happen. Um, one of the things that, ha like one of the success points, I would say, of any free or open source project is when people are doing things with it you don't know about and you find out about it later. And this means what you're doing is so great, other people want to work with it, and they're so far removed from you, they don't even think to talk back. Um, in addition to that, there are people who are choosing not to use it for reasons that don't talk with us. Uh, so if any of you, by the way, are at institutions that have thought about using the Open edX platform and haven't, if you want to talk to me about your reasons, I would love to know more about those. Yes. So um, I work at a company where basically I'm prevented from using any AGPL software or contributing mm -hmm. to it because it's too viral and they consider it unsafe to use. Um, have you found uh, many people with that issue and has it been worth to use AGPL over GPL v3 or Apache 2 or any other license? So the reason why we're using the AGPL is because for the most part, most of what's happening with the OpenX platform is server-side hosting. Um, it's people doing stuff and all like in their own servers and then kind of throwing out the courses into the world. Um, so for us, using the AGPL is just necessary. Uh, the reason we chose to do it is because inherently we're an education project. Our focus is on enabling people to learn and to teach and educate. Uh, from that perspective, it's really important and even necessary to make sure what's happening is also going out back into the world. Um, that's a question and that issue is one I'm really happy to talk about more later, but I have a whole lot to say, so I don't think right now is the time. Thank you. Could you 
talk a little bit about what proportion of the contributions are coming in as sort of Xbox, which are under a non-copyleft license, and what proportion are coming in to basically the core code, which is AGPL. I'm, I'm curious how much the AGPL is helping versus the portion that is just people see this open project and want to contribute. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's beneficial for people to submit their work as features rather than X blocks. Um, that's because anything they submit as a feature, if it gets into the like the the main code base, is guaranteed to be supported, and it's going to make sure that everything else we do will still work with that. Um, so that's a benefit for it. With Xbox, actually, the most common copyright for an external Xbox other than AGPL is somebody forgot to put anything into the license file on GitHub, so it's blank. Um, and that's not great. <laughs> is, there, is there more to that? Did I answer that? Is there more? I was curious about the solutions. Okay. Um, off the top of my head, I can't really say that. If you want to find me later, I'm happy to like pull up my records of contributions and kind of go through and see what I can find. Is that a good, better answer? Great. Hi, um, the mission needs were a billion users. Yes, a billion a, learners. A billion learners and, uh, found that, and financial sustain, sustainability. Financial sustainability. And you said you've been very good at making, at helping people make lots of money. Mm -hmm. Are they contributing back in cash? Um, so as a 501c3, we do accept donations. Are service providers giving us donations? No, uh, as far as I'm aware. They do, however, help sponsor our conference, which is a big expense on our side. So them doing that is really great, and we really appreciate it. Um, we have... Uh, some referral programs with service providers where uh, like we help connect them with people uh, who are interested in running their sites. Um, however, because you know we're education focused and we are using a free and open license because you can just grab it and do what you want with it, we don't have the kind of standard traditional revenue streams. Um, since we have partner institutions, there is this very sort of separate relationship uh, between how they're interacting with edX as a company, like as, as, as an organization, uh, and how they're interacting with the open edX project. The benefit of this for us is we don't actually have to answer to anyone other than um, like our CEO and our, our uh, technical advisory board. Um, so we're able to make decisions based on what we think are, is best for learners. This comes in through feedback from educators, from faculty members, from researchers. We work with some really, really great education researchers. We have an amazing person on our staff, Dr. Peter Mitros. He's great. I recommend reading some of his stuff. Um, so we're able to really be driving our development because, like, towards uh, maximizing the benefit of education. Uh, the downside to this is, yes, service providers are not like giving us back sacks of cash. Yeah. I, yeah, I just remembered I was supposed to be repeating questions. Um, Donna suggested that uh, we talk with the Drupal organization because they're dealing with some of the same financial, uh, I don't want to say issues, situations. Um, you mentioned that you'd made some licensing changes to allow people to do some proprietary things with it. Um, is there any value for the project in allowing them to use it if they're not contributing back, or are they contributing back in other ways? So anything that makes the platform stronger or gets the word out is good for us. Um, this isn't necessarily the argument that any news is, is like any advertising is good advertising. Um, but we're getting more positive advertising this way, certainly. Um, so that, like, that's helping to attract people and that it is helping to, like, in ways make the ecosystem more robust still, right? So let's say that you start, uh, like you do a startup and you want to have an X block that it's proprietary, but what it does is it deliver kitten, delivers kittens to people's doors during the middle of their final exams because they're stressed. Um, and you sell that. But it still helps us in some ways, because then other people who are interested in running the platform might say, hey, there's this kitten delivery, delivery X block. Sure, I have to pay $5 for it, but it's totally worth it, because everyone gets a kitten.
perhaps one more? Anyone else? No? Okay. Great. So find me later if you have any other questions or you want to talk about things or you want to hear me talk more about licensing and free software. Great. Thank you. <laughs>